You don't leave this bed, do you? I, I don't leave this bed. No. Um, unfortunately, I can't because of my leg and health issues. I just decided to get like 15 Munster cans oh, and yeah. drink them all in one go. I did watch The Whale and it felt like a horror movie to me. I, I turned it off and I started crying and I cried myself to sleep. Any, anything could happen at any moment with my heart, lose oxygen and that's it, suffocating and that's it. The only way to bring me back, they were saying that they will throw me on the floor if they can't resuscitate me. A few years ago, you had to be airlifted out of your mum's home. That was the most devastating time of my life. But now you're looking for a way out in the form of the drug Wagovi. You getting this drug now is a case of life or death. Yeah. Super morbidly obese and with a BMI more than triple that of an average overweight person, at just 33 years old, Jason Holton is believed to be Britain's fattest man. Jason, hi. Oh, hi Holly hi. from Talk TV, nice to meet hi, you. Nice hi, nice to meet you too. How are you hi, feeling hi. today? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm okay. Once a healthy, happy child, Jason is now 47 stone, unable to walk or do anything other than play video games while his mother cares for him 24-7. Yeah. Talk to me about what you do day to day. You're, you don't leave this bed, do you? I, I don't leave this bed. No. Um, unfortunately, I can't because of my leg and health issues. I'm up in the morning, I have my care, personal care and everything. It's mainly consisting cigarettes and just listening to uh, some some music. It's just that really. And then if I want to turn the TV on, I'll turn the TV on and just watch maybe uh, some programs or something. What music do you like? DJ MC Nee and all the, all the old kind of ones, you know, because at that time, that's the time when I, enjoyed life. This is a very small room, isn't it? And obviously, as you've already mentioned, you can't leave your bed. Do you feel confined? Do you feel trapped? I am trapped. I just get to a point sometimes where I think I'm in my situation, I'm in. And, you know, I just get upset. I, I, the way I do it is cry and then cry myself to sleep and then wake up. That's the way I that, that I sort things out. And then I'm refreshed, my mind's refreshed. And what is it specifically that sort of brings you to tears, Jason, about your That situation? I can't sit up and get up to, to do what was right in the first place, to move. You've completely lost um, mobility in your legs. The mobility in my legs, no way, it can't happen. I can't stand, I can't walk or anything. I have to be in this bed. Uh, yeah, that's it. At one time, he ate crisps for breakfast with down 15 monster energy drinks in a row and devour huge portions of Donner meat every day, consuming up to 10,000 calories. How much do you weigh right now? I would say not, n no more than when I was discharged. Around the 245, 255 area of kilograms, yeah. And what were you at your worst? Over 365 kilograms at my worst, yeah. Okay. At your worst, what would you eat? The consistent of my diet was one meal a day. Yeah. But I stuffed my family's face with land on me, with no sauce, no salad, no pit of bread, nothing. And then sometimes I would have chips on the side, but sometimes I wouldn't. And then I've got the juices and the Diet Coke, yeah. I had a problem with energy drinks. Because I couldn't drink alcohol or take drugs, I just decided to get like 15 Munster cans oh, and yeah. drink them all in one go. As many as 15 energy drinks in one go? Yeah, yeah. You've been sort of labelled with the title of Britain's biggest man. Yeah, Britain's biggest man. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Um, it makes me feel awful, like a horror film. I did watch The Whale and it felt like a horror movie to me. I had to turn it off. I was crying my eyes out, my, my mum. I said to my mum, I said, don't watch it. I, I turned it off 
and I started crying, I cried myself to sleep in that film. I don't know how someone could have did that film. To me, it was a horror movie. Because with what they were saying, how someone is that size and how the film was done, that's not me, because it was very upsetting for me. Jason wasn't always this way. Jason was a healthy, happy boy, wasn't he, when he was a child? What was yeah. he like as a boy? Oh, he was lovely, yeah. <laughs> always out and about with his friends and, you know, yeah, he was very busy. Oh, yeah, that's, that was when I was at my mum's place and that's my little brother on the left-hand side, James. And he was only about three months old. Yeah. He had nice big eyes. And... <laughs> and what do you think when you look back at that photo of him now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. It's lovely. I didn't know you had that one. <laughs> Talk to me about what kind of child you were. What memories have you got from childhood before? Well... Because you were healthy, I, I, weren't you? You were a healthy boy. I, I was a healthy boy as in, like, always physical and active and always walking, always on riding my bike miles, you know, push bike miles and riding it miles and everything. Always, but I was always chubby and always got to a bigger size all the time. That's when we were in Marbella in Spain. And what do you think when you look at that? He's obviously so happy there. Yeah, he's so happy there. That's when you think everything's going to be all right, you know? Does it make you sad to look at it in that sense, then? Sometimes it does, yeah, because, uh, you know, he's so normal there, isn't he? He's just doing what he wants to do and running about and everything. And you wish that for yeah. him again? Yeah. It was a happy childhood. I still can't go back want to go back there and restart my life but I know I can't change the ways I was with towards not only food fluid everything really when was it you first noticed do you think that there might have been a problem with his weight when he was getting a bit older I reckon you know, he started swelling up and everything, and he was probably, I don't know, he was out with his friends getting takeaways or something, you know. So even though I prepared the food for him, he'd go out with his mates and have food. But he didn't have a lot to eat. This is what we can understand. Where did this all begin, do you think? Oh... I think I had hidden problems at school. As a teenager, I didn't show that I was eating any time anyway. Mainly out in the day, and then at night, have a large meal, big meal. Large, large meal, and cooked a lot. I was cooking pasta, tuna and pasta, chicken and pasta. So secret eating from sort of early teens Jason blames mental health problems and bullying at school as being behind his weight gain. Were you bullied? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was bullied, but I got through it. What Just sort? got through it by laughing it off, you know. So. That must have been difficult, though. Yeah, yeah. Added to the strain on you? Um, yeah, but I knew what I was. I was fat anyway, so it didn't bother me. But me as a person, in general, if it was the other way around, I wouldn't go saying things like that to people. What were they saying? Uh, just like, oh, trouble loves fatty or things like that. Do you think you were depressed at that time? And that affected your relationship with food, maybe? Yeah. And as I said, I, even though I looked happy and throughout my school and socialising, there's always What's happening really inside, no one knows, you know. He says the death of his father when he was three also had an impact. Maybe if I had my father around, around maybe there would be 
rule set to what I'm eating and stuff, you know, to stop me from putting things like that in my mouth, you know. But there, there wasn't, you know, and you never listen to your mum. I don't know, I've just been like that, you know. I'm just, that's how I am. Over the last few years, Jason's health has rapidly declined as a result of his increasing size. He's come close to death now a number of times. Yes, he has, about four times, three or four times, because he also had sepsis as well, which he missed out. He had sepsis and he was seriously ill in a coma then. That was touch and go. You know, within a few days, he was, they said he was going to be all right, but they said he was critical at first. I have the problem with the lymphedema, which I, is visible, it should be visible anyway. You can see the, the leg and then mainly as well. It moves from time to time and reduces from time to time and then gains from time to time. I've got it here. It's all here. And then it sometimes it just travels back this side. The problem is, is that if the fluid builds up in the heart and lung, that's when the game is over. It's game over for me. Because of my oxygen levels, I have to constantly get the sleep app machine to push my heart, you know, just to keep surviving, you know, to keep the breath before I go unconscious. You've had organ, near organ failure a number of times, blood clots, respiratory failure, strokes, and you've lost your mobility, haven't you? And that's put you in hospital a number of times recently, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. How many times do you think you've cheated death then, I suppose? What, as what I know, maybe three or four, but then the hidden times I don't know because apparently I've been told they're not allowed to say could be more than four times, yeah, but they're not allowed to say sometimes if there was a problem. They don't have to, I mean, you know, the National Health Service. Any, anything could happen at any moment with my heart, lose oxygen and that's it, suffocate and that's it. And the only way to bring me back, they were saying to me that they will throw me on the floor if they can't resuscitate me. They'll just budge you on the floor and resuscitate you. I don't know what to do because I don't want to be thrown about. If, if, if I die, I just want to die. How did you feel like when you said about being thrown on the floor? Did you feel dehumanised in that sense? I felt like I was just nothing. In 2020, he collapsed and had to be airlifted by crane from his mother's flat by a team of more than 30 firemen and engineers. There's something attached to the flat. It's a, I think it's a man. It's a man in a bed. I think they're bringing him out now. They're bringing him out of the window now. You have had a number of times where you've had to visit hospital, and one of those times was a few years ago, where you had to be airlifted out of your mom's home by crane. Can yeah. you tell me about that? That was the most devastating time of my life. What was that experience like for you? It must have been pretty terrifying to be airlifted out of your mum's home. The terrifying part of it all was the amount of people outside. I didn't know there were so many services out there. Uh, police, Ambulance just over this and the crowd now I'm thinking, oh my god, everyone's gonna be there's gonna be crowds of people and there were, but they were all in their homes looking. And I think that's what it just comes straight to me. Uh, Was it quite a sobering heart, yeah. moment for you that? Quite a sobering moment in terms of sort of where you were at. So that's why I was saying, can't we just leave, you know? Why, what's the hold up? You know, because even though I, I wasn't, I was still critical, but it wasn't about that. It was about, I didn't want, I wanted this to all clear up so no one knows that it had happened. But it was, it was too tough for me. During his most recent hospital visit, clinicians considered taking him to London Zoo to use their scanning equipment. They were talking about taking you to London Zoo. 
Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Why? To be examined properly through the x-ray. Yeah. I know it, it sounds insane, but it was that, yeah. So they didn't uh, have equipment that could properly no. test or examine you? No. What was it like for you when they said that they might have to take you to the zoo? I mean, how did that feel for you personally? I mean, was that quite hard to hear? No, because I knew I knew what, what how I view myself in a picture. My size is completely says it all. Do you know what I mean? So that's how I wasn't too shocked. After his latest brush with death, Jason moved back into this custom-built council bungalow in Surrey, fitted with specially reinforced furniture. Who did this bungalow? Who the made council? It? Okay. And did you apply for a grant for that? How did that work? Yeah, they had to put, apply for a grant first and then uh, get the builders in to do all the work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't know exactly how much it costs, but they don't never tell you anyway. Yeah. Work they did do was this bathroom. It was a tiny bathroom. But Jason doesn't go to the toilet, does he? Because he no, can't move. No, no. No. Talk me through then these double doors. This is something that's changed. Yeah, this used to be a single door here, mm -hmm. going to the bedroom. But they have doubled the size now mm -hmm. of it. And then so this is where there, you sleep. There was, yeah, there was a small window here. But they had to... Um, put the door in and uh, and they did all of the, if you go out here, they did all of the concrete out here as well. You're essentially now his full-time carer, you sleep yeah. here, don't you, in yeah. the room next to Jason, Jason. so I can hear him. <laughs> can you sort of list or describe what you do day-to-day -day for me for Jason? Wash him food and the drinks. Obviously, because he's in bed, he can't do anything for himself. So he's always calling me. Oh, Mum, is it OK for um, a bowl of uh, brown flakes? Oh, thank you, Mum. Right, do you want a uh, no, thanks. I've got some water there. Maybe you later sure? I'll have an orange juice or something, yeah? And how difficult is that for you and for your mum, sort of day to day, carrying out these responsibilities, looking after you? How does that make you feel? It, it, it's awful because I feel like my mum, she's, she's put herself down, let herself go because of it, you know? And she always been by my side and never wants to change that. See, the thing is, if my mum wasn't here now, I'd be in serious trouble, big trouble, because the fact is, is that I can't pay for 24 hour care. Do you mm. feel guilty about that at all on your mum? I mean, how do you, how, when she's doing these things for you, like you just oh, said, she's... I really do, yeah. You may think that this is just, my mum's fault or something like that, but really, I don't know. It's just, it's just a diagnosis. It's really, my mum never put that food in my body or recommended it anyway. Parents in particular will no doubt watch this and given the round the clock care you now have to provide, think what an yeah. amazing job you do. Yeah. But it must also be very difficult. For you? Oh, it is very difficult because I can't really leave my life, if you know what I mean. So, you know, like going out and doing what I want to do. So it is very difficult. But, you know, at the end of the day, Jason's my son and I love him very much. I, I shout, look, Mum, this isn't realistic. Move out and concentrate on yourself. I will sort myself out here, no matter how hard it's gonna be with the care and everything, you know? 
and I, and I still won't blame her if she did that, but she's more we're more friends as well, so she stayed with me, so it's fine, so and you like having her here, don't yeah, you? yeah, yeah, yeah. Unable to work, Jason is on benefits and it's estimated his health care has so far cost the taxpayer hundreds of thousands of pounds. So at the moment, obviously, you are in the benefit system. That in, in essence, the taxpayer is funding your care. Yes. yes. And okay. what do you say to that? What do you say to people that are critical of that, of how much this is costing the taxpayer? Try and be in my shoes and then we'll discuss. You can discuss that as your own opinion in some way, if I, that makes sense. That's their own opinion. You are deserving yeah. of that money, of taxpayers' money? I believe so. I believe so. I've, I've got, even though 50% is my fault of being in this situation, I've been misdiagnosed 50%, but I don't know, and, I, and I, the reason why I won't go into any of the NHS stuff and that is because I appreciate the fact we've got it. What would you say to people, and this is often a common, common misconception and criticism that is levelled at people who are obese, that it's their fault, that if they just stopped eating, that it wouldn't be a problem, that you would be healthy. Playing devil's advocate, have you brought this on yourself, do no. you think? No. What would you I say kind to of, people? I would say 50% have. But the rest of the 50% is unknown. Now he's vowed to cut down, but insists that dieting no longer works. And what are you eating yeah. in a day now? So talk me through your breakfast, lunch, dinner. OK, well, it would vary, yeah. So usually it's a sandwich for breakfast, then a sandwich and two yogurts for lunch, and then dinner time the bowl of rice I said about plain rice with some chicken tonight sauce with the with the mushroom in already. Yeah. Is food right, the uh, enemy? Would you how would you describe food? Not now, it's not the enemy. Enemy, sorry, yeah. It's not because I'm not eating like that anymore. But the the horriblest thing is I'm still grinding myself to sleep because I know I'm not and I'm not and I'm not gaining anything from it. I'm not losing weight. When I say gaining, I mean I'm not losing any weight. Gaining the effects of not being obsessed anymore is still, still haunts me because I'm still like this, even though I've made changes. What changes have you made? Just not eat, eating loads of junk and, and stuff my face. In fact, Jason says his only hope now of a normal life is the weight loss drug Wagovi, and without it, he'll die. But now you're looking for a way out in the form of the drug Wagovi. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. You're on a wait list, is that right? Something like that, yeah. Um, see, the thing is, I was told they looked at my medical records, it won't work. And then I was told, oh no, actually, we're not saying it won't work. We have a distribution problem with the with the drug. So how meaning that it will may never come to the UK. How does that and make you feel? That make me feel really bad, you know. You know. So and and I thought to myself, um, maybe when the next election comes, I'll actually vote for another government, and then maybe things might change with the NHS with distributing that drug, but that's not till 2025, that election, so. What do or you I believe so, anyway. Where do you think you'll be in 2025? I could be dead, for sure. Do you feel like then, Jason, and sorry to put it in such stark terms, but you getting this drug now is a case of life or death? It is, yeah. But whether it will work, oh, see, I believe it will at an, at, if it's regularly used, how they say, prescribe, I, I believe something could work. I believe that's my only hope, is the injection. It is my only hope, that injection. So I'm hoping they will distribute it one, one day. And hopefully I'm still alive to see it. What happens if he doesn't get this drug? If he doesn't get the drug, 
or they can't give it to him for some reason, then he's still going to be stuck in the same position. Because even though he doesn't eat very much now, he's still got the lymphedema and the lymphedema is all through his body, you know. So it's just travelling where it wants to. Yeah. His, his legs and his stomach, it's at the moment. But then if it starts travelling up to his heart or whatever, then that's the danger zone. That's when the, he's at risk of heart attack and everything. So is it a so, matter of life or death? Yeah, because I, I believe time's over for me in general. But I'm coming up 34 now in May. So I know that I, I've, I've got to try something and that drug, uh, the injection for the weight loss may, uh, may could make some changes for my future, yeah. What's your message to the government then in relation to this weight loss drug? Make it priority for people that really need that really need it, not people that are just just chubby or obese, because I don't feel that's the problem. I'm in the access, access, access. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I should be a priority to at least be given a try, a six weeks trial of it, just to see. If not, I'll take a step back. That's it. I, I will, and I'll just take being like this as it is. Wagovi injection or not at 47 stone with a BMI of 89.1 and showing no signs of losing weight, Jason's time is running out, but he still holds out for some semblance of a normal life. When you think about them, when you think about your future, what do you sort of dream about? What would you love to do, to be able to do? Go out. You know, go out. Uh, go even for a walk. You know, and and a routine outside. Just go to a busy area and go out, walk. Just feel normal.